Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar session. The title of today's session is Tools and Tips for Virtual Education Programs, an Introduction to Collaborative Online International Education, uh, otherwise known as COIL, and 100,000 Strong in the Americas Partnerships. Uh, we have a, an excellent lineup of speakers today. Uh, my name is Ukiah Bush. I'm the Director of Public-Private Partnerships at Partners of the Americas, uh, a nonprofit organization based in DC that's been working in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere since 1964 to connect people and organizations across borders to serve and change lives. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees will be on mute through the duration of the session. Uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom uh, panel of your Zoom window. Uh, please submit questions at any time, and we will uh, refer those to the panel at the end of the session during the Q&A period. Um, once today's uh, session is over, I would invite all of you to visit the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund website at 100kstrongamericas.org. Uh, and sign up for the Innovation Network uh, if you have not already so that you can be notified of future opportunities and events like this, uh, as well as our grant opportunities uh, that we issue on a regular basis each year. Um, we are going to start today with uh, an introduction uh, to the COIL Center and the COIL model uh, presented by Jan McCauley, Assistant Director at the State University of New York Center for Collaborative Online International Learning, and Bob Balkin, Director for Latin America and Caribbean Programs at the SUNY Office of Global Affairs. We will then hear from various uh, implementers, practitioners of the COIL model, uh, several of which have also won grants from the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund uh, and used COIL as part of those exchange programs. We'll hear first from Dr. Jonathan Little from Monroe Community College in the SUNY system, the State University of New York system, who partnered with the Fundación Universitaria Tecnológico Comtenalco in Colombia for his COIL program. We will then hear from Laura, Dr. Laura Penman, Associate Professor in Biology at SUNY Monroe Community College, and her colleague, Dr. Maria Luisa Lopez Segura, Professor at the Tecnológico Nacional de México at the Laguna Campus, uh, who partnered for their COIL program. Uh, and then we will hear from Dr. Solange Isa, Professor and Dean of Professional Studies at Simón Bolívar University in Venezuela, and Dr. Natasha Smith, uh, the, a director at the United States Military Academy at West Point, uh, and previously at Binghamton University, which was the partner uh, for their COIL program. Uh, but before we jump into that, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Director of Educational Programs at the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, Maggie Hug, to share a few words about the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund and what brings us all together today. Thank you, Ukiah. Um, hola a todos. Buenos, buenos tardes, buenos dias to everybody. Bon dia for our Portuguese speakers. I just have a couple things I want to share, but first I want to say thank you to my colleagues, my 100K colleagues, 100K Innovation Fund colleagues at Partners of the Americas, especially Laura and Yukaya, uh, for coordinating this wonderful uh, discussion today. And then a huge shout out to my friend Bob Balkin, who I've known for many, many years with our work in Mexico together. I had the pleasure of working with Bob Balkin at SUNY in Mexico City for many years and his colleague, Jan. We had a conversation about a month ago, over a month ago, that has led us to today, and we are so thrilled to have Lara and Dr. Isa from Venezuela and Jonathan and Maria Luisa from Mexico. We uh, salute all of you and the work you do every day. And just to, for everybody in our listening audience, I wanna say also a shout out to, I believe, many of my colleagues from the US embassies throughout Latin America, maybe joining us in the public affairs section. Thank you to them as well for all the support for the 100,000 Strong Innovation Fund. As you can see with the logos on the slide, and as many of you know, 
the 100,000 Strong Program and the Innovation Fund is a team effort. Like today is a team effort, so is the 100K program. It's a team effort between our, the Department of State in Washington, the Bureau of Western Hemispheres, WHA Bureau, our embassies, partners of the Americas, companies, foundations, and a huge network of wonderful higher education partners, colleges, universities, communi community colleges of all sizes and stripes. We can't do the 100K program without our wonderful colleagues in the field of higher education. Obviously, these are challenging times, for everybody in the field of higher education, we all know that. A huge shout out to everybody in the listening public, whether you're based in the United States or you're based in Latin America. We have to keep doing our work. We have to keep building bridges through understanding, through international education, through education abroad, through virtual education programs. And we're so excited that we have 100K program leaders from several partnerships with Mexico and Colombia and our partners also in Venezuela. This, we want you to come away from today's session with two tools in your toolbox. One tool is the 100K program and the partnerships, the partnership grants that we offer. And we'll have news about that coming up. I invite all of you to sign up to the 100K website. And then of course the COIL, the main point of today's discussion is COIL. If you don't know about it, you need to know about it. If you've used it, then you'll learn some new things. We invite all of our listening public to it, use these two tools, the 100K program and COIL, to continue with your work of building partnerships and providing academic training to faculty and students under any kinds of um, background, whether you're wanting to do training, whether you want to do exchange, et cetera. We are excited for what you will learn today. So a huge thank you to Jan and to Bob and the team and seguimos adelante. Excellent, thank you, Maggie. And thank you again to this fantastic panel for joining us today. Uh, in this period of, of COVID-19, there has been such an enormous surge in the interest and need for tools and education around virtual, uh, virtual exchange and virtual programming. So thank you all for joining us for this panel today to share what you've learned and what you've done over the years uh, most especially using this COIL model. And with that, I'd like to pass it to Jan McCauley uh, to lead us off and, and share some information about COIL and the COIL Center. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the, the kind words and introduction. Um, we are really excited to share some information with you today about COIL, um, for those who, who haven't been introduced to the, to the methodology yet, and um, primarily I'm really uh, pleased that we have such a great group of panelists here today who are practitioners of COIL and who have just recently done these projects and, and are ready to share with you their experiences. And that's where, um, where people really start to understand how COIL works and what it looks like in the classroom um, is through these kinds of discussions. So um, I won't belabor the, the overview too much, but we want to make sure that everyone kind of understands the foundation from which COIL is built. So I'm going to actually um, pass the mic first to, to Bob Balkan, and he's going to talk a little bit about kind of the history of where the COIL Center has been in Latin America. Um, in addition to our partnerships with, with uh, Partners of the Americas and the 100K Initiative, we've done a lot of work in Latin America over the years. So, Bob. Thank you, Jan. And thank you, Maggie and Ukiah. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, I wanted to just kind of uh, do a, a quick review of, of what COIL has been doing in, in the region, but just, you know, what is COIL? You know, it's a methodology. You know, it's, it's, you know, collaborative online international learning. And the first thing people say is, oh man, it sounds like I need a platform. No, 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 this is it. All you gotta do is have this, a smartphone, and you will have your students in your universities working with students at other universities in other countries. And it's uh, in, in communicating in their way, in, 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 in their formats, and uh, in building uh, projects together. And, in the course of a semester, we're not talking about changing your, your syllabi, changing, uh, or it's, it's about taking one uh, module 
of your semester. Maybe it's a five week module. Maybe it's a little bit longer than that, but it's not changing the whole, it's not creating a new course called a COIL course. It's a COIL enhanced course. And anyway, just to kind of sensitize those of you who haven't been involved in, in COILing, it is, it is not very difficult to approach. It doesn't, there's no exchanges of funds between one university and the other. This is the kinds of things and partnerships that professors in one country can do with professors in another country and have immediate impacts on their students who may not be able to do any travel internationally during, during the, the next semester, which is pretty much all of us, right? All of the students. Um, going straight into it, the 100,000 Strong in the Americas uh, program, we've been uh, happy at SUNY to be involved. The SUNY, the State University of New York, developed this COIL methodology and it was, it became such a movement. It required SUNY at the system level to create the COIL Center. And uh, Jan is here representing that COIL Center. And, uh, and anyway, in, in terms of our work with 100,000 Strong, SUNY has been a partner with the 100,000 Strong movement from its very beginning. We have enjoyed the opportunity to, to do grants in a lot of countries like uh, Mexico and Chile and Brazil and others. And, uh, and we've um, uh, wished to continue that. And you know, in terms of what we've been doing in the region, we started off uh, earlier, well, about five or six years ago, what we called the Latin America Academies. This was in partnership with Santander Bank from Spain. A lot of you may have had that opportunity to work with Banco Santander. They're very active in a lot of Latin American countries. They have a very special emphasis on uh, helping uh, fund higher education programs and students who are uh, in universities around the Americas. And anyway, they got involved early on with us in doing these Latin America academies that uh, brought our SUNY system, which is a 64 campus system, one of the largest in the world, 400 plus thousand students and bringing access to that SUNY system to universities, not just in other countries, but even other universities from the US are part of the COIL network. And that's what we did with these Latin America academies, thanks to Banco Santander. In a, a moving forward a little bit in time, we stayed very involved in Mexico uh, we were SUNY's had an office for almost 20 years in Mexico. And what we have done uh, with help by the State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Mexico was to put on a program that would go out to the states of Mexico. Many of the states in a country of 32 states didn't have experiences, universities with experience in using this methodology and having a lot of students travel abroad, etc. And so we brought COIL to the provinces of, of Mexico to 18 of the different states and um, was very successful. In a very similar way, we were able to partner with the U.S. Embassy in Venezuela and to be able to uh, bring COIL to a country that is, has its challenges, particularly in being able to uh, work in other countries right now and to, to be involved in all kinds of international engagements. COIL is uniquely, uniquely built to go to those places that may seem hard to reach. And it could be the solution for a lot of you, not just in this time of COVID, but it could also be for, the, for, for going forward when you wanna give your students, not all of whom can afford doing a, a in-person study abroad experience, but to give them internationalized, globalized education uh, through, the, through the comforts of their, of their smartphones and uh, with their own professors and colleagues uh, in their universities. And with that, I'd like to uh, pass the, the, the microphone back to Jan. All right, thank you, Bob. Um, okay, so Bob gave you a little bit of a glimpse of kind of how COIL works and, and things like that. I'll elaborate a little bit. So um, COIL really, ex you know, what, what we're trying to do with collaborative online international learning, which is a form of virtual exchange, um, is to extend very significant and deliberate uh, international and intercultural experiences to students throughout um, universities, not just at SUNY, but as Bob mentioned, throughout the United States and around the world. Um, I, I have a link here and I can actually put it in the chat as well so that people can use it because it is um, 
I'll do that after actually, but I'll put it up there so everyone has it. And I think these slides will be available as well. Um, we do have a, a kind of what is COIL website that can help explain in much greater detail kind of how the COIL Center operates. But basically, as Bob mentioned, um, this is very much a project-based learning kind of methodology. It, takes place within the curriculum that already exists in your classrooms and we'll hear more from our from our panelists about how they made COIL work in their curricula. Um, but basically faculty and students both collaborate at various levels in these projects and uh, they exchange cultural information but also content-based information throughout their collaborations. So um, one of the things to keep in mind is that obviously, you know, we're talking about uh, internationalization of the curriculum. We're talking about intercultural exchange and intercultural competency development. But COIL actually sits in a spot where it can serve a number of broad institutional strategies and goals that are important to higher education at this moment. So because it's a virtual technology uh, kind of methodology and all of these things and maybe because it's project based and the students are really interacting directly with one another it's it's a high impact practice it um, involves a, a great deal of 21st century skill development such as you know kind of this sort of online engagement and professionalism in dealing with people virtually, um, you know, managing intercultural teams, all of these kinds of pieces. Um, and, and as Bob mentioned as well, it's, it, COIL is one of the only ways to really tap into the full uh, breadth of equity and diversity that exists not only around the world, but even within one's own campus and one's own classroom. So you have, you know, immensely diverse groups of students in your own classroom, and this allows them to really exchange their ideas with one another and with their peers around the world in a unique sort of way. So um, it sits in the center of a lot of these pieces. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so basically where COIL starts is with faculty members, with professors. Um, the professors come together and we work at the SUNY COIL Center. We work directly with the professors at various universities throughout SUNY and around the world as part of our global partner network. And those professors come together to really create these projects. So the, the partners that you see um, here on the webinar today have gone through this process of working together and that's really where the intercultural exchange starts. You know, every professor brings their own their own curriculum, their own syllabus to this project, and they find the, the points of overlap. And they might be from very different disciplines. They might have, you know, very different language backgrounds, all of these kinds of things. And uh, so that's really where the exchange begins is between those two professors. Um, they design the activities, they, you know, figure out the, the calendar and the schedule, they develop shared outcomes that they want their students um, to achieve in the project that they're going to do. Uh, and, and then they get ready to kind of launch that project as part of their two existing courses the coming semester. So once the students are involved, they then form teams and or are put into teams and they develop um, dialogue around all kinds of issues as devised by their their professors and this is you know kind of facilitated conversations project-based assignments and this can as I said can be you know around issues of culture or more specifically around the content of the two courses and the points of overlap or you know most often both of those things are happening kind of in tandem um, also, as Bob mentioned, this is a relatively simple model. There's not a lot of MOUs that have to be signed. There's not transfer of grades and transfer of tuition and financial kind of implications across um, campuses and across countries. So uh, this is really about professors and students working together on these very specific projects, but students are awarded grades and credit in their own classrooms and on their own campuses. This is just sort of a, a visual model of that collaboration that I just described. So you have, you know, your two different courses at two different institutions. The professors collaborate first there at the top. They devise the COIL module that's going to sit inside their classroom structure and the students participate in, in that project. Um, you're gonna hear, you know, 
from from our panelists about how their projects really looked on the ground. But one of the things that I want I, that we always like to share is this exam these examples of coil projects that have come out of very, very different disciplines, because often professors come and they say, well, I teach journalism, so I need to find a partner somewhere else in the world who teaches journalism so that we can share content, of, you know, in in both of our courses, but really um, a lot of what we do are these cross disciplinary sort of partnerships and we see so much creativity from professors like the ones you'll hear from today um, in how they find overlap interdisciplinary overlap for their students to really be able to enhance the learning that happens in this pro in these projects and in their classrooms. From the COIL Center perspective, um, one of the things that's really also important to keep in mind is that this, you know, we have the professors who are playing a key role, obviously, we have the students who participate, but it's also really important to, to bring in your institutions and have them understand the value that this brings to, uh, to your students and to your institution overall. So, it, you know, as I showed you in that, that first diagram, it really, COIL really can touch upon a whole variety of institutional goals and strategies. So having commitment from the institutional level from provosts and rectors and academic affairs kinds of uh, administrators to really have them understand the value that this these kinds of projects can bring to their students is is quite important. At the COIL Center, what we try to do is kind of create a foundation of, of leadership for these activities, best practices, resources, and provide um, a network, really. You know, our, I think our, our greatest value is the network of professors and, and thought leaders that we have at our disposal at any given moment. Um, our coordinators and professors are a wonderful community of practice and we meet with them regularly and that's you know kind of where a lot of the the ideas come from that that we put out to the community to support the work that everyone is doing so this sort of just gives you a, a glimpse of the work that the coil center does kind of on the daily basis we you know these are our, our primary goals on any given day are to you know really find ways to make the connections between institutions and professors um, so that they can do this work to build this community of practice and support the work that everyone is doing um, and you know provide resources and things like that to everyone who's who's interested in doing this work so this kind of um, sums up what we do and where we try to to put our energy in support of of these efforts um, I think you know it's it's in this moment um, when everyone is kind of really focused on how we are providing um, education and how we are shifting to online learning and how we are managing this new reality in in light of the covid pan pandemic i think that coil gives us a space to step back and consider why we do what we do um, and really think about the value of educate the values of education besides the value of education in a monetary sense we want really to have space to think about the values that education brings to our students the values that collaboration across countries and borders and cultures and difference all varieties of difference the the goals of education are really to to create a a group of citizens that are going to to be able to function in this new reality right so those those values are really what we strive for in these collaborations um, so i think i will now pass it off um Ukiah, you'll have to remind me who's up first thank right thank you so much of course. Uh, jan really appreciate that dive we're going to hear now from practitioners of coil coilers if you will uh, we'll start with Dr. Jonathan Little, Associate Professor of Geography and GIS at Monroe Community College. Jonathan, I'll hand it to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ukiah. All right. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. All right, hola. Uh, glad you uh, joined us today. Um, I'm excited to share this experience with all of you. 
this was a joint collaboration between Monroe Community College in upstate New York, Tecnológico Campo in Cartagena, uh, SUNY Coil, and 100,000 strong in the Americas. Uh, I'm, I'm Jonathan Little, and I'm a geography professor at MCC in Rochester. I'm also a PI on uh, several grants, including a uh, National Science Foundation Advanced Technology Education Grant to develop a virtual geospatial program. Uh, last June, I was fortunate to travel to Kazakhstan as a uh, Fulbright specialist. Uh, the project team con consisted of uh, Jorge Alice, um, Spanish faculty at MCC, um, Jose Paellas, um, Professor at uh, Campolnaco, uh, Enrique Diaz Infante, also of Campolnaco, and uh, Monica Toulouse of um, TC. So the project was an innovative hybrid study abroad in geospatial technology and Spanish language that integrated virtual learning and in person student presentations. Four students from each college collaborated uh, virtually for four weeks and then traveled to their peers' college for a week. We used uh, SUNY's COIL uh, for the virtual portion, um, which lasted four weeks. Uh, students accepted into the program had to take an intro GIS course, and if they weren't proficient in Spanish, had to take an intro Spanish course. Um, before we get into the details of the COIL weekly activities, I wanted to give you a brief overview of the technology component. Um, in short, geospatial technology was used to visualize and assess water quality in Cartagena, Colombia. Um, so GIS goes by many names. You may have heard of it as uh, GIST, uh, geospatial technology, remote sensing. Um, as you probably know, it's everywhere today from your smartphone um, and to uh, big data. Um, at MCC, we have a virtual um, GIS certificate program to, to um, provide students with the skills for an entry-level geospatial position. And we also have plans to develop a completely online um, AAS in uh, GIS. So the virtual component of the project consisted of four weeks. Um, and as I mentioned, integrated the COIL met method. Um, the COIL component consisted of three Zoom meetings with um, introductions and an icebreaker in the first week, as well as a project overview. Um, in the second week, um, students Zoomed with their uh, peers. And in the third week, we um, had students uh, write four stereotypes that you think people, let's say in Columbia, may have about you. Um, Students exchange ideas and thoughts via Google Documents and WhatsApp, both of which are free. And these icebreakers, I thought, really set the stage for connection um, and were a key to um, starting off the program uh, right. Um, after the COIL style um, icebreakers, MCC students wrote instructions to develop a mapping app to collect water quality data along the coastline in Cartagena. Um, MCC students translated this into Spanish, and this was reviewed by um, uh, our Spanish uh, faculty, Jorge Alas, before being sent to uh, Campo um, In week four, uh, the Campo students created that, the app based on the instructions and then tested it on campus. Uh, data collection can be done uh, either online or offline for upload to the cloud later. If online, the data can be mapped uh, instantly. Um, as, this pre excuse me, as this presentation is not focused in on the uh, in-person component, I'll keep this uh, short. Um, in week five, MCC students and faculty traveled to Cartagena where we were uh, warmly welcomed um, by uh, the admin, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, the next day, we drove to the beach, collected some uh, data, pH, temperature, with an instrument uh, for ground truthing purposes. Um, MCC students also led a humanitarian mapping event in Spanish. Um, and I also introduced that in Spanish. So that was a, a great experience for all of us. And we also had some wonderful um, cultural experiences. 
Um, in uh, another uh, week, uh, the Kampalnako students traveled to Rochester, where we had where they had a chance to sit in on some GIS classes and Spanish classes, presented their thoughts on uh, cultural differences and similarities, and shared their mapping apps to uh, faculty and admin at MCC. And all of that could have been completed um, virtually. Uh, here are a couple sample maps created by Kampalnako students using the data collected with, with the app. Um, although there's much to be said for the connections made for meeting people in person, again, all of this could have been uh, created using uh, the, the COIL method. Um, the relationship uh, developed uh, between the students and faculty uh, far exceeded um, uh, certainly my expectations. Um, after going through the, the program, three of the four Colombian students had new interest in learning more about um, other cultures and pursuing uh, GIS geography as a career. Um, I spent time individually with each uh, Colombian student and shared my knowledge of graduate schools and geography and GIS in Latin America, as well as the uh, states via uh, Zoom. Um, <clears throat> So it, some of the challenges, uh, as a, a couple people have mentioned, there was no um, process to transfer grant funds um, of a sub award to an international orga organization. So MCC had to uh, start a, a new process. But now that we've ha we have that created, um, hopefully the next time if we do receive another um, grant like this, um, that will be much more uh, seamless. Um, in addition, the, um, some of the tax forms were um, the Kampalnako uh, wasn't familiar, which is completely understandable. Um, as a result, the, the process of actually uh, using the money took, uh, took longer than, it, than expected. Um, but uh, as, as I mentioned, now that we have these processes developed, it, it, I think it would be very uh, smooth next time. So it, I'm excited to say that the collaboration is alive and well today. Um, uh, earlier this morning, I was uh, WhatsApping uh, with Enrique um, about the presentation. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, one of our advanced GIS students um, presented um, their uh, virtual internship um, with Kampanako, which um, involved uh, using remote sensing data to assess changes in um, mangroves along the Caribbean uh, coast of Colombia. Uh, the students also um, developed a Python, so uh, computer programming lab, um, and she translated that into Spanish for uh, Kampanako students to use. And again, that was completely uh, virtual. The 100K grant also inspired me to provide additional international opportunities for our students. I've developed an additional virtual internship with the University of Mexico to uh, develop a mapping app for citizens to collect the water quality data from a local river, as well as a part partnership with uh, the Monteverde Institute in uh, Costa Rica. Um, I'm always looking for new partners. If you're interested in collaborating, let me know. You could be a virtual internship host. Um, no GIS experience is necessary. Um, the folks that I worked with in Mexico um, did not have any GIS experience and it worked uh, really well. Uh, the project could entail app development um, on things other than water quality, um, remote sensing via drones, satellites. Um, as well as uh, lab development. I'm also considering writing, I like writing grants. Um, I'm also considering writing a new proposal to, to fund additional uh, international collaborations. Um, uh, I'm still on the Fulbright Specialist roster, so if anyone is interested in uh, hosting me for a couple weeks in um, Latin America, that would be uh, absolutely wonderful. So thanks uh, for listening. Uh, big thanks to 100,000 Strong in the Americas and SUNY COIL. Um, without their support, this collaboration would not have been possible. Uh, I look forward to any questions you may have um, at the end of the webinar or um, by email. Muchas gracias. Excellent, thank you so much, Jonathan. Wonderful presentation and what a wonderful program. So glad you thank were you. able to get support from the Innovation Fund. 
I would now like to introduce Laura Penman, Associate Professor in Biology at SUNY Monroe Community College, and Dr. Maria Luisa Lopez Segura, Professor at the Tecnológico Nacional de México, Campus Laguna, uh, to share about their program. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. I am Maria Luisa Lopez from Tecnológico de la Laguna in Torreón, Mexico. And I am here with my colleague, Laura Pinman from Monroe Community College to share with you some of our work using COIL to create opportunities for civic professionalism and interdisciplinary cross-cultural exchange. Laura? I am Laura Penman from Monroe Community College, and I'm a colleague of John Little, who you just spoke with. This is what our campus looks like this time of the year. But there are half of the year where it tends to look like this after a good snowstorm. Well, uh, we don't have snowstorms, but dust storms like yesterday. And this is our school in La Laguna region uh, in the northern, northern central part of Mexico. So we started our COIL training back in 2015 and have remained COIL partners ever since. Uh, this is an artifact from that first COIL meeting. We have two plants. One on the right side is coming from Rochester, New York. And if you look carefully, you can imagine that this would be the Atlantic coast in Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. So the plant on the right represents Torreon, Mexico. And yes, there's a built-in coil as these two plants intertwine and support each other. So we have had four years worth of coil partnerships and the modules have been different every year. So let's think uh, about your students. What professional skills do you hope they have when they finish your course or graduate from your institution? And think about your communities. What are some unmet needs of people in your community? Okay, now please keep thinking about these questions throughout our presentation. If, um, at this moment for all higher education institutions, it is very important to develop international partnership. But internationalization requires a new innovative approach and to incorporate non-traditional ideas. Over the years, we created several different coin modules, many icebreaker and assignments. But from the beginning, we valued civic professionalism as a complement of student collaboration, and we promote these statements in our courses. Uh, the concepts, I won't read it, but you have here on the screen, uh, were civic professionalism, civic engagement, service learning, and community partnership. So we don't have time to discuss all four different modules. Uh, instead, we will share what we did with our sustainability themed courses back in 2017. Our challenge then was to design a COIL project around sustainability that met our course learning outcomes. Maria Luisa was teaching sustainable development and I was teaching an introductory course in sustainability. So in this case, it was quite easy to find overlap in content. Maria Luisa is a chemist and I am in a biologist, and so uh, we have done some interdisciplinary work as well. And as Maria Melissa just stated, we were seeking to address civic professionalism goals in our modules. So the solution that we're going to talk about, broadly speaking, had students reflect on their own communities. They would form groups about sustainability topics that concerned them. These groups were made up of MCC and ITL students from both campuses. 
they would research the problem and propose a sustainable solution to that problem. We wanted to pick an icebreaker, which as those of you who are involved in COIL know, icebreakers are very important activities to help students overcome the, the discomfort of getting to know each other. The icebreaker we chose was to choose one of your favorite locations and explain why that location is important to you. This encouraged students to focus on their own community from the start and to identify things that they valued. Students then selected a topic of interest in their community and formed groups in each school focusing on the same topics. There were five groups at MCC and five groups at ITL. These groups researched their selected topic from the community level in order to A, understand it more fully and also to communicate it clearly to the people who don't live there. And we as faculty paired groups from the United States and from Mexico with as close to similar themes as possible. This quotation from Einstein was an important one to share during this collaboration. Again, given one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes finding the solution. We dedicated most of the time in the module with students identifying and describing the problems in the two communities, looking for the core similarities and recognizing differences. I will share with you this flow chart of activities in the module. So again, we started with the icebreaker, the favorite location within the community. Then there were five groups formed in the United States, five groups formed in Mexico with topics of interest in these groups. Individual research at the local or community level. So we have separated into US and Mexican uh, focuses, come back together to share the problem with the other partner group. And during this time, students would ask clarification questions and discuss similarities and differences regarding those problems. Each group of students would then develop solutions and come back together to share their solutions and act as sustainability consultants, um, providing maybe alternative solutions or ask further questions for the other team. So in this slide, we can see some of the topics. In blue are the US students and in red are the Mexican students. And so we paired bee conservation groups with tree conservation groups, plastic recycling and textile recycling, farm scale biofuels, versus the composting of organic food waste, educational outreach, and clean coal education. And the fifth group is one that we'll focus on today, food nutrition and scarcity and the problem of obesity. So this map shows food deserts in Rochester, New York, and a summary about how many areas of Rochester do not have access to fresh, healthy food, which could be contributing to the local obesity problem. One of the students in Torreon mentioned that they were surprised to know that Rochester has a high rate of obesity. We have several parts of this discussion, and we can see that obesity rates might be attributed to the fact that fresh food is less available here in the United States than it is down in Torreon, and maybe having less hours of daylight causes people to eat uh, to help cope with their seasonal depression. Again, in red font, a student in Mexico said, I, in our culture, I think it is the gastronomy, mainly because of the people who uh, consume can't eat vegetables with the rest of the food. And Mexican Americans are in very ways much alike. Mexican Americans consume enough soda to put us in the top 10 of soda consumers in the world. The conversation continues looking at the economics of purchasing fresh produce from Walmart versus a McDonald's meal in the United States. And 
then this last slide about this coil module was a statement that I think you would find in any coil module, regardless of the discipline. It is so interesting to me that our problems are so similar, even though we live in areas that have two completely different climates. And this also shows the proposed solutions for these groups. On the left-hand side, we see a food link truck and a solution being to teach children to grow their own food, to give them the option of earning a cooking badge for healthy eating habits and the importance of fresh foods. And on the right-hand side, we see a solar dehydrating oven to help preserve fresh vegetables for later use and encouraging the development of snack or soup recipes that use these nutritious foods. And that is a lovely segue into this slide. Well, uh, our COIL partnership also led to funding of research and study abroad to a 100,000 K uh, strong in the Americas grant. Uh, and this is a project that we developed together to collaborate uh, with, the, with this grant. Uh, it was uh, based on a uh, design of a production unit to dry regional products, vegetables, fruits, and aromatic plants using solar energy in a sustainable rural micro enterprise model in Coahuila, Mexico. So you can, you can spot this, the stars and the map and the map. Rochester and Torreon started a very challenging project together with a 100K uh, Strong in the Americas Fund. So here we are, uh, my partner Laura and me in Petronilas, uh, rural community near to Torreon area. And we pointed at using our knowledge to serve people with our students. And we found community partners through Fundacion Diversa Coahuila. And uh, we start to work with a group of women in this uh, isolated village in Coahuila with a very, very uh, strong or high um, heart problem with scarce of water, scarce water. Our two major, major goals were the, to develop sample techniques to grow plants with little water and improve the solar hydration of uh, local products using uh, a process, a dryer process, um, a, dry, a dryer prototype and a drying process based on needs of users. So this is uh, our team. Uh, we provide these students, very enthusiastic students, with a real problem to solve. Uh, they had to design a production unit to dry vegetable, fruits, and aromatic plants using solar energy for this community. Uh, well, um, MCC students develop uh, three prototypes to efficiently water plants which were tested by women in Petronilas who will use them. So they travel to Mexico, to Torreon, and we visit the community to uh, present the MCC uh, projects. And it, uh, students in Mexico at Tecnológico de la Laguna focus on improving the solar dryer, optimize the drying process, and develop new products of, for the market. Here in the picture, we, you, you can see the community and the first dryer they were using uh, with a very uh, low efficiency, efficiency. So the solar, the solar dehydrator works using basic concepts, uh, basic convection, convection and uh, the head of the sun that we have uh, all the year in a very high level in this region. But the, this old model had some problems. First, very low capacity, very difficult to carry. They had to, to use plastic and tissues every time they, need, need, they needed to work with it. And they needed people to, to help to work with the dryer. And uh, another very important thing for food, uh, it was the food safety. 
the dust, the insects, they, they have to cover with a tissue, as you see in the old uh, dryer prototype. And the right side is the new one, the first uh, prototype that we made, because actually we are in the, in the um, solar dryer version three or four. <laughs> so on this chart, we have a comparison of these results that we, we got with, the, with this project. The old and new dryers are compared in their characteristics. Uh, you, can, you can see the area was uh, um, improved. The capacity uh, also based on Apple. Before they only could dry two kilograms of uh, apples and now 20. And uh, also a heavier uh, dryer and less space to store for storage and the time for drying also was improved. So, Laura. So with this project, we had a partnership in civic professionalism that started off focusing on sustainability in a broad sense and then was able to be applied toward the empowerment of women in this isolated village. So we are looking to continue the solar dryer production unit work using COIL in the future, um, probably in the spring of 2021. And um, we will be testing irrigation methods and prototypes both at MCC and at ITL. And now we get to test them in Petronilas because the women there have computer with internet access through the grant to help them communicate with students and teachers. We would like to include business and sociology COIL collaborators, so please contact us if you are interested in joining our efforts. Again, we're planning on spring of 2021. And so thank you for your time, and uh, we hope to continue evolving this partnership. So Partners of the Americas, the COIL Center, our own support from MCC and ITL, Santander, which helped us establish our partnership all the way back in 2015. And thank you for listening to us and participating in this webinar. Excellent. Thank you, Laura, Maria Luisa. Fascinating programs. We very, greatly appreciate your, your joining us for the panel today. We're going to hear now from our final set of panelists, Dr. Solange Issa, Professor and Dean of Professional Studies at Simón Bolívar University uh, in Venezuela, and Dr. Natasha Smith, uh, director at the United States Military Academy at West Point, um, previously of Binghamton University. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself there to make sure. Um, and can everyone see the slides? Just want to check. Okay, perfect. Um, so hello to everyone. It's a pleasure for us to be joining you today to talk about our partnership. We want to start off by just sharing a little bit about the courses that we pull together um, in order to start the partnership. I am Dr. Natasha Smith and at the time of the partnership I was working in the Student Affairs Administration Department at Binghamton University as an assistant professor. The course that I was teaching, Culture of the American College Student, was a required course for all graduate students in that particular program. And the course focused on understanding the cultural experiences of various college student populations and how the campus environment affected the college students' experiences. Hi, I'm Dr. Solange Issa from Venezuela. I teach human entomology related to best at the Simón Bolívar University. We think the most important pests at the cities are termites and ants, but they are also social insects that build nests to live and have a peculiar social behavior where they interact between them to protect their community against stressors. Our core partnership was focused on offering the students of our courses the possibility of exchanging ideas and different point of view comparing to ways of seeing nature. Then we found common themes between our courses since we are from a very different areas. However, when approaching it from a behavioral point of view, 
we found coincidences between humans and social insects regarding the forms of communication against dangers and their defense response in the places where they live. With this in mind, we choose the point to review and then the teaching strategies, especially taking into account that Natasha's group courses were compulsory master courses and mine was elected for undergrad biology degree. Another important decision was the moment in which we should focus the model because the US term is 16 weeks and the USB term is 12 weeks. To facilitate the connections that needed to develop between ourselves and the students and between the two groups of students, we used a variety of technological mediums. Part of our consideration when identifying these platforms was student familiarity with the platform, ease of use, and faculty comfort with orienting students to the technology that was selected. For faculty to student interactions, WhatsApp groups were created for each one of the classes, and both faculty members were enrolled in both of those WhatsApp groups. However, students were only enrolled in their institutional group. This was done to provide each class with an opportunity to interact with both faculty members. Facebook served as our learning management system for all intents and purposes for the partnership. And that's where we posted a lot of the faculty um, videos, the course assignments, and then the rubrics related to those assignments. For the student to student interactions, we allowed students some flexibility in determining how they engage in informal discussions but we did use Padlet for student introductions and Facebook for formal discussions. And again, WhatsApp and Google Docs for collaborations. Lastly, to present the content, Solange and I both created lessons using VoiceThread and TED-Ed. In addition, we provided supplemental reading materials to the students. With regard to the syllabus, um, what we wanted to do was to make sure that the students knew that the coal experience was nested within the overall course and it wasn't something that was just an add on it was something that was built in intentionally. So our section for the coil syllabus um, was nine different sections and again that was nested within our individual class syllabi for a more seamless learning experience for the students. Um, we do have a handout that I think you all have access to, and you'll notice on that um, an abbreviated version of one of the calendars that was incorporated into the actual COIL syllabus. It includes the weeks, um, the student learning outcomes, the tasks associated with those outcomes, and then the assignment instructions. What's missing on the handout that you all will have access to um, is essentially a column that outlines the technological tools that are needed to complete the assignment, but that was included for the students. The second calendar that was included for students as a part of that syllabus outlined what um, the faculty were responsible for providing to those students. For the core partnership, we identified three major graded events. Um, a knowledge grid, the video infographic, and end of course reflections. In addition to those, we had students complete introductions and group discussions, which were foundational assignments necessary to building community between the two classes. To give you a better idea of the assignments, we wanted to share an example of one of the video infographics that was created by a group of students. Natasha, just so you're aware, we're not able to hear the audio, but we can see the visual. Oh, okay. Well, I can go ahead then. Um, I think you all get an idea of the video infographic and what that can look like. I'm sorry that you couldn't hear that, but I can always share the link. 
um, in the chat feature so that you all can see it just kind of on your own. In addition to sharing the links related to the Facebook page that we created and then also to the Padlet as well. So what we want to do now is just shift into sharing with you a little bit of the student feedback that we received at the conclusion of our partnership. Well, for Venezuela students, the experience was excellent because they were able to exchange with the students from other universities. It was a challenge for some commu to communicate in another language and also due to the fact that studying subjects related to human behavior within a biology curve of invertebrates. The USB students found that there is not so much difference between their college from other universities regarding their human culture. The evaluation for was interesting and especially the infographic was a challenge in which they have to share with their group partners. Of course, limitations always. The limitations found for the most part were related to the country's condition, such as connectivity, energy, access to technologies. The courses were given at different times, so synchronous classes could be not be held, and they believe it is necessary. Suggestion will be better if we could use WhatsApp and Facebook for informal communications and other platforms for formal ones. However, perhaps due to the not having access to platforms such as Blackboard, because they are not freely accessible, is translated into using other less friendly platforms. With regard to the feedback that I received from the students at Binghamton University, um, I primarily, it's grouped into three different areas, content, peer-to-peer, -peer, and link. For content, the majority of students wanted to be challenged more by the course material. In particular, they wanted the opportunity to teach the student affairs course material to students in Venezuela. And prior to the start of the course, I actually spent three weeks introducing my students to Venezuelan culture and discussing aspects of intercultural communication with them. However, in their feedback, um, students expressed a desire to have additional cultural lessons incorporated. Um, in particular, they wanted those lessons taught by the students. So in other words, they wanted to hear more about Venezuelan um, culture from Venezuelan students, and they wanted the opportunity to share about American culture um, with the Venezuelan students, which leads into the peer-to-peer -peer feedback. Every student in the class wanted more opportunities for formal and informal interactions with the partner class. Lastly, the majority of students wanted an additional two to three weeks dedicated to the partnership. And some of the students even suggested having the partnership extend as long as the full semester. In moving forward and considering the ways in which um, we can learn from our partnership and build additional partnerships, Solange and I are in different places. Um, I recently relocated further south in the state of New York for a position with the United States Military Academy. So I'm really trying to determine how best to incorporate core strategies with the cadets I will be teaching there. And I would like to find a new partner and start a new exchange to include the COIL model in biological diversity, which is a course that I teach for a larger, larger number of students from different careers and thus bring the COIL experience to a wider universe between the university. For some Simon Bolivar University, it is important challenge to maintain this type of exchange for both professors and students, given the realities present in the country. From the point of view of university politics, these possibilities are necessary since they allow establishing connection between institutions and novel actions in terms of technology. And of course, looking for the universities as center of knowledge and progress. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you all. We're happy to answer any questions that you all may have about our partnership or any future collaborations. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Dr. Issa, very much appreciate you joining us on the panel. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you. We're going to 
start a Q&A session now. I'll be moderating some questions that have been submitted by attendees throughout the, the session. We'll take, I'm going to take three questions at a time and then open the floor to panelists to chime in uh, as you will, uh, though I may direct a few questions uh, that are specific to, to certain panelists. And, uh, but feel free to chime in, any of you, uh, if you have something to add. Um, our first question is from uh, a professor in Argentina who is wondering how he, what he can do to motivate universities and scholars to get into COIL and, and to be, begin COILing, especially thinking about his context in Argentina. Uh, another question perhaps uh, for you to answer, Jan, is do we need to be a part of your network to take advantage of COIL, to use COIL? Uh, and finally, could you provide examples of the incentives you give professors in, to participate in these programs? Are they strictly economic or, or are there other incentives? So with those three questions, I will open the floor. I can start off real quick. Um, so, so yes, uh, so we have a lot of activities through the COIL Center that are open to the public, webinars and different events and things like that, um, that, that are open to everyone. Our professional development workshops um, are fee bait. We have a fee for, for those seats, but, and, and there's a discount if you have a membership in our network, but they're actually open and available to all. So people can, um, can get started in, in COIL at any point, um, even if it's just them. Um, getting institutions to think about COIL is, and, and to value these experiences is, um, is sometimes a challenge and it's a, kind of a matter of thinking about, you know, where you sit in, in your university and how you can um, reach out to various people at various levels and where, you know, kind of those those with a friendly ear for this m might sit. Um, we also are certainly available for, for brief Zoom calls to kind of introduce the concept and, and things like that. We do, you know, a lot of those sort of 30 to 45 minute kind of Zoom calls to get people started thinking about this methodology. So we, we can always help with that and resources and things like that. We do have um, that link that, that's out there. Feel free to share that around that's open and accessible and has a lot of good information on it, including some syllabus examples and things like that. Um, I can pass the mic though for the Argentina specific question and somebody else wants to jump in. I don't wanna hog the floor. Bob. Yeah, no, I, I, I can answer the part about uh, the incentives uh, for professors because this may surprise, but there really are not a lot of universities that are giving economic incentives to professors to coil. So in one sense, that's a dis, that's a dis, uh, or uh, it's unfavorable because you don't have that, uh, you know, that idea that this will help me climb the ladder to, you know, to better income or perhaps to my tenureship. But most universities that we are working with now are looking at COIL and giving that, you know, the, the psychic income, uh, you know, a, uh, it, it's due. And so professors who are becoming COIL coordinators on their campuses, it is a status and it is an, an important role to play to be working with other university professors in your campus and sharing the COIL methodology and the experiences with them. And uh, so there, there is a track that is being developed university by university, but unfortunately we haven't run into a lot of places where uh, doing a COIL course, you know, again, my colleagues on this panel might be able to tell me, oh, Bob, you're so wrong. I just won the lottery doing a COIL course last semester but I'd be interested to hear if that was the case. Excellent. We're gonna move ahead to the next few questions uh, so we can answer as many as we can. And, and for everyone out there, I'd like to let you know that though we won't be able to answer all of the questions, we will be sharing some written responses, uh, some course syllabi, the presentation slides and other materials in a follow-up email along with the recording of this session. So stay tuned for that and, and more information coming. Um, for, the, for the panel, there are a number of questions about language and how you address the language barrier 
whether in your student selection or in the design of your programs. So if you could speak to that. There's a question, do you know of any asynchronous courses collaborating using COIL? Uh, and specifically for you, uh, Dr. Smith, Dr. Issa, did the Mexican student, or sorry, um, for the, the Mexican project, did the Mexican students travel to Rochester to teach or discuss American students' healthy eating habits? We'll start with those three and move on. I can go ahead and start with uh, the language piece. Um, so one of the things that Solange and I decided that was important was to present both English and Spanish. Um, even though we had some students from both sides that could speak both languages. Um, and so all of the course material that we put on Facebook, for example, was presented in both English and Spanish. When we created our voice thread presentations of the course material, um, it was presented in either English with Spanish subtitles or Spanish with English subtitles um, for the students. And when it came to their um, I guess more informal discussions when they were just kind of collaborating on the different projects that were assigned to them. Um, oftentimes they will revert to English um, and not necessarily use both. And I think that was because, and Solange, please jump in, but I think that that was primarily because um, the Venezuelan students wanted to practice like their English. Um, and so it was helpful for them in that regard to do that with some of the informal pieces. So um, I agree with everything that Natasha just said. Um, we also added a component where if a student wasn't proficient in um, Spanish, they were um, had to take an intro, intro level uh, Spanish course. And um, I, I, that just uh, made things more of a level playing field for everyone. So I think that uh, helped out. And for our partnership, uh, we communicated with our students in both languages, but all of the formal um, communication between students was was in English. And where Maria Melissa teaches, yes, it, I'm correct, it is required that they have English proficiency at that school. That's correct. Yeah. So they the students actually appreciated the opportunity to to practice and they were nervous, I think at first but the students in the United States were very supportive and encouraging. Excellent, wonderful. I will and, uh, actually, sorry, go ahead. Yes, uh, the Mexican students uh, traveled to Rochester for a week and spent uh, there for a, an academic program, a very full uh, program, activity, uh, cultural activities, academic activities in the MCC, is, um, and um, they, they made friends with the students there. And it was very, very nice, this experience for, for my students. Um, and uh, all this was with the support of uh, the grant. Uh, so our call experience gave us this opportunity for American students and Mexican students to travel and uh, visit and know the, the other universities. So we create, uh, I think I, we, we have created a, net, a wonderful network for learning, do research, and also make friends. Excellent, thank you, Maria Luisa. Uh, there's a question now uh, about whether there is a database of uh, contacts for people to form partnerships available. Uh, and I'll just say that the, uh, the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund uh, and Innovation Network do provide a database on our website uh, of more than 2,300 institutions uh, in the region that are interested in partnering. And you can search by country, by, by theme, uh, and by academic topic. Uh, there's a question, and this will unfortunately be our, our last question, um, but, and I would direct it to Jan first and then perhaps the, the rest of the panel. What would you suggest for schools and professors that are interested in starting a new COIL program? What are their first steps? There are lots of people doing this work um, around the world. Obviously, we would we are always open to new COIL partners at the COIL Center. Um, I will be distributing, um, I'm, I'll send to you guys um, to include in the follow-up email some information about joining our network. I made I made a mention in the Q&A in one of my typed responses that we are um, on the verge of launching a new website. So 
please excuse our current one. Um, it's not in great shape. So please, um, so stay tuned for that. And um, you know, like I said, we're always looking and many of the panelists here are looking for partners and things like that. So, um, so we would welcome any of your universities to join our network and start working with us. First steps are really, you know, often finding the professors who are, you know, ready to come, you know, begin these sort of projects, um, who have an interest in intercultural, who in experiences, who might have been ready to lead short-term study abroad programs that were have been canceled because of these experiences. So there's usually, you know, some some base professors, baseline of professors that you can identify who are who might be eager to get started and then simultaneously um, doing some outreach to the administrative levels to get that that kind of support from above as well. So, and then I'll see if anyone else wanted to jump in on that. Yeah. Um, so I, I uh, agree with uh, Jan there. Reaching out to SUNY Quell is a great, great way to go. I've also found that um, I've made a lot of con connections at these webinars. Um, as well as uh, the face-to-face -face, um, uh, conferences, too. Great. Would any other panelists like to provide some comments or advice on how to start a COIL program? Well, if not, um, we will close in a moment. Uh, before we do, I just want to reiterate uh, that we will be sharing the recording of this session course syllabi uh, provided by the presenters for the courses that they implemented, their PowerPoint presentations and other materials that can be helpful uh, in, in getting to know SUNY, COIL, uh, these projects and 100,000 Strong in the Americas. Uh, and I'd like to invite you all also to join the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Network at 100kstrongamericas.org and to join the SUNY COIL Center uh, at their website. And I'd also like to invite uh, my colleague from the State Department, Maggie Hug, to say a few closing words. Thanks, Yukaya. I just want to say, reiterate a huge thank you to, to Jan and to Bob for your tireless work in what you're doing with COIL. Um, huge thanks to Jonathan, Natasha, Laura, Maria Luisa, Dr. Issa, all the way from Venezuela. It's an honor to have you from Venezuela. All of these teams have presented such rich, wonderful programs that had both the online activities and then also the exchange in-person in exchange activities. And so just huge, massive kudos to all of you. I shout out, we have a lot of people pinging us on chat and I know that we have some incredible thought leaders in the field from Mexico, from Peru. We have a lot of 100K uh, ambassadors with us on the line. As Ukiah said, we can't get to all the questions, but we're very committed to providing follow-up information. We're going to be sending a huge email that has the recording, that has all the information and the presentations. Kudos on the PowerPoint presentations, fascinating. Natasha, I hope we can hear your video in another way sometime. And just, um, we're, we're all in this together. This is, we, we have, as J I like what Jan said at the top of this, you know, all of us listening and learning today, we have a commitment to global education. We have a commitment to tapping into equity and diversity on our campuses or in our day jobs. And it's even harder now under the, the, under the COVID and the pandemic and, the, and how this is impacting higher education systems in the US and in Latin America. We do want to encourage everybody to think about the tools, the 100K program as a tool, the COIL as a tool. There are lots of ways to continue to build bridges between the US and the rest of the Western Hemisphere. And these are two tools today, and we hope that, that this has been useful. And just a huge shout out to everybody listening, huge shout out, my, especially my embassy colleagues, and then also all of you and to team partners, to Laura, to Penelope and Ukiah, and let's, we, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going and making rich opportunities for both faculty and students, for academic training, for exchanges, and workforce development. We have to keep doing this work. So congratulations to everybody listening and working in this every day. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you again to all of our panelists. I, I'm sure everyone will join me in a, a virtual round of applause. Thank you to all of you. You're so wonderful.
And thank you to everyone for attending today. And with that, we will close.